So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to, uh, this is going to be mostly like a pedagogical, I hope, talk about quantum noise and dissipation and bats uh, with an eye towards the future when someday we might be able to build quantum simulators using um, arrays of superconducting qubits and we'd like to uh, do a simulation of a many-body system that has, let's say, a well-defined temperature or it's coupled in some way to some interesting bath. And, um, and then uh, at the end, I'll show you a little data uh, from uh, Irfan Siddiqui's group at Berkeley. So it's not, you know, it's not like really spectacular, I'll warn you at the beginning, but it's the first baby step towards uh, um, a future world where we might be able to have large systems of um, qubits and do interesting many-body physics with them. So you can, to build a quantum computer, you're going to need a large array of um, quantum bits, and they, you have to be able to control them completely and perfectly. If you can't do that, then you say, actually, I'm building a quantum simulator of a <laughs> many-body system that uh, is coupled to a bath that I can't control. <laughs> so, and, uh, and this, the work I'll tell you about is uh, carried out by my postdoc, Claudia de Grandi at Yale. Uh, Okay, let's see, maybe I have to get rid of something here, I don't know. Okay, so the question is, uh, we always have noise and dissipation, and it seems like a bad thing, but um, actually you can, it can sometimes be a good thing. You can use uh, noise and dissipation to help you produce entanglement and do other good things, and even to fight the effects of other uh, uh, noise. <coughs> So uh, let me uh, start with, uh, uh, you know, so dissipation and decoherence is caused by coupling of your nice quantum system to some bath, some set of degrees of freedom that you don't have control of. Here's a, here's a toy example. I have a qubit with a, a splitting frequency omega q and then some a noise coupling to the bath which can cause T1 processes that the qubit can uh, flip from up to down and down to up. And uh, this is some, think of it as a, if this were a harmonic oscillator, that would be like a force. And uh, the noise correlator for that force uh, classically is, of course, real. I mean, uh, all classical quantities that you measure are real, and their correlation at different times will have a, a real value. And therefore, the spectral density of that noise, which I'll remind you from the wiener kinchin theorem, it's the, the, spec, the Fourier, tra the power spectrum, the Fourier power spectrum is just the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function of the noise. That's a standard uh, theorem. And its spectral density, because this is real, has to be uh, symmetric in frequency. So, that, so electrical engineers usually talk about, when they say the spectral density of noise and you hear about like um, Johnson noise of resistor and they say 4 kBTR instead of 2, which is what a good physicist should say, that's because they, they always take the sum of those two. The noise at some frequency is S spectral density at omega plus spectral density at minus omega. Uh, but you don't want to be doing that if you're a quantum mechanic because they're gonna, they can be different. Uh, so, and the reason that it, this can be asymmetric can be traced back to the fact that the noise operator may not commute with itself at a later time. And I'll explain that momentarily. So, um, uh, I'm taking the Fourier transform of this thing, and each of those operators, F, is a Hermitian operator. It's an observable, but their product is not a Hermitian observable, because if you, if you take the adjoint of this and you find out that uh, if the noises don't commute at different times, uh, then that thing is not itself, you're taking the Fourier transform of something that's not itself a Hermitian observable, and therefore the, the noise correlator can actually be complex instead of real. If you have a real observable, 
and you have its value now and you want to correlate it with a real observable at a later time, and the value of that correlator is not real. That's, that should bother you. Uh, and so when you Fourier transform it, you can get something which is asymmetric in frequency. So here's a really simple example, the only one I ever understand, the harmonic oscillator. And uh, the, f the, the noise operator might be like the position of an oscillator that, that, that's in the bath. There might be many such oscillators, but let's just focus on one. And uh, uh, if I um, calculate the autocorrelation function, I will get two terms, uh, one of which corresponds to um, uh, B dagger B and the other to B B dagger. And because these um, uh, B and B dagger don't commute, you get this uh, one corresponds to the stimulated emission term. It's the bo if the bath is in equilibrium, it's N boson plus one, the boson sign factor plus one, and the other is N boson. And uh, since they're simple, if you solve the Heisenberg equation of the motion, you just get exponential oscillation there. The Fourier transform is a delta function. But the coefficients are asymmetric. Yeah, I don't know if this is going to be relevant, but you didn't evolve B with respect to back homotonin. You evolved it to a homotonin from the last flight. Right? Ah, so yeah, the, yeah, it's, it's uh, well, I didn't even write down the free Hamiltonian. But yeah, so this is, um, this is the noise spectral density of the bath in the absence of the coupling to my system. There is coupling. Oh, I see. The Hamiltonian is coupling to the system. That's what you're talking about. But I guess it's in the limit of small f. Yeah, it, well, it's, it's in the limit where it's, a, uh, it's going to be a bath, so, and, and, uh, and assuming linear damping. And, and there's all kinds of details which I'm leaving out. But this is the. This is the correlation function. So you know from like the Kubo formula, if you have linear response, it's the correlation function of the thing before you turn on the coupling tells you how it will respond to that coupling. Uh, at least in linear the, response. It's linear response, exactly. Linear response yeah. So this is just the free, pro yes, this is just the free propagation of the harmonic oscillator. So this, of course, corresponds to stimulated emission into the bath. That is, the bath absorbs energy. Uh, and that, that is given by the spectral density at positive frequencies. And em absorption from the bath to my system, the bath emits, that's given by the spectral density of the noise at negative frequencies. But if I, your, your stimulated emission term also includes a spontaneous emission term, right? Uh, yeah, y yes, sorry. Yes, <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. Thank you. And uh, so if I have many such oscillators with all kinds of different frequencies, I can end up with, instead of two delta functions with different amplitude, I can end up with some spectral density, uh, which is not symmetric. And I just want to emphasize that over here, negative frequencies, that corresponds to the bath giving energy to your system. And positive frequency, the bath is absorbing um, uh, energy from your system. And to get to Bill's point, if you had zero temperature in the universe, an excited state of your qubit can still decay into the bath by a spontaneous emission. And so at zero temperature, if you were in equilibrium, zero temperature, the spectral density has to be zero on this side and can be non-zero over here, allowing for spontaneous emission. Okay, now it doesn't, the bath does not have to be in equilibrium, right? It could be some weird bath that I'm pumping and doing things to. But suppose I had like an um, optomechanical system or some atomic transition, something that has a very well defined frequency that it, and it interacts with my bath only by exchanging quanta at one frequency. Then it's going to be, let's say, capital omega. Then it's going to be able to uh, emit energy into the bath at this frequency and take energy from the bath at this frequency. And even if it's not in equilibrium, if those are the only frequencies it interacts with, I can take the ratio of those spectral densities and define an effective temperature from the detailed balance condition. 
If I interact with the bath at two frequencies and they don't correspond to the same temperature, then it's, of course, not in equilibrium. But if I only interact with one, I can pretend it's in equilibrium and assign a temperature to the bath. Okay? Questions? So you are leaving off situations where one can have self-decoherence, meaning an isolated interacting system would, of course, equilibrate because the interaction by itself, with itself. Sure. Um, I'm thinking right now of a very simple system with maybe a few qubits interacting with a big bath. Now, the big, in some circumstances, the big bath could be degrees of freedom of the system itself. That's but at least I should think of them as like distinct. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That, that's and, I, and in particular, I'm going to... Uh, rig up the bath and provide pumps and energy and, and friction in ways that will cause this to have an interesting spectral density under my control. Uh, and then, of course, in the classical limit where h bar goes to zero, this ratio will become one, and we recover my statement from before that the noise spectral density is symmetric in frequency. Okay? Okay, so um, there's also, uh, it, I, was, I, I finally understood Fermi's Golden Rule quite late in life and, and, uh, and wrote a 100-page review article explaining my, my insights. Uh, but the correct way to think about Fermi's Golden Rule where, you know, you, 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 um, there's all these subtle arguments about your decay, a sharp level decaying into a continuum with a wide bandwidth, you should think of that continuum as providing quantum noise with a short autocorrelation time. And then you can work out an understanding of how this noise can cause uh, T1 transitions. And the uh, Fermi's golden rule is just given by, uh, in this simple example, where the matrix element of sigma x is 1 between uh, causing excitations. Uh, is the transition rate upward is just the spectral density of the noise at positive frequency and, um, uh, sorry, downward, positive frequency, and upward at negative frequencies, okay? And if you go back to that Fourier transform, there was a 2 pi in there, just like in Fermi's golden rule. Uh, the matrix element squared is 1, and then that uh, delta function that I had for the single oscillator is the energy conservation that you see in Fermi's golden rule. Okay, so, um, so can we, so uh, it's not friend or foe, it can be friend and foe. And um, so let's think about what, when it's bad. So suppose I have a quantum system and it's described by some density matrix, which I would like to be pure. Maybe it even is pure at the beginning, but at the, after some time, it has been mapped because of dissipation to a new density matrix. It still has to have trace one. It still has to be positive. Uh, still has to be Hermitian. And the most general transformation that it can undergo uh, as after some period of time is this uh, Krauss operator representation, where these are some, some operators that describe the effect of the unitary evolution of the system under its own Hamiltonian plus the dissipation uh, from the bath. And as long as this is true, the trace will be preserved, and because it's E, E dagger, the positivity will be conserved. So how can, and, and what we'd like to do is get rid of all these effects and go back to the nice pure state we started with, for example. Uh, or, and uh, so there's kind of two ways to do that. So this is some non-unitary transformation, some non-unitary evolution, because I've traced out the bath. I have no control over that. How can I undo <coughs> that? When all the knobs I have in my apparatus are, if they're just terms in the Hamiltonian that produce unitary evolution, um, how do I, how can I do that? So there's, there's um, active feedback in which you <coughs> measure something about the system, which, and then if, for those of you that believe in wave function collapse, that's a non-unitary <laughs> thing that happens. And that allows you to kind of undo uh, some of the dissipation because you apply a unitary which depends on the result of what you measured. So that's one thing you can do. 
Uh, and then there's a kind of autonomous feedback where you embed your system into a quantum bath and it's not just, you know, friction or something, but it's a special bath that you rig up to have uh, properties that will allow it to uh, create and maintain coherence, for example. And um, by apply I'm going to tell you about applying coherent drives to, this, to the bath, which will interfere in tricky ways with the quantum noise of the bath and produce um, um, a nice uh, bath which has properties under your control that can do good things, like cool. And uh, so this was also a collaboration we had with the Siddiqui group uh, a few years ago uh, <coughs> where we uh, demonstrated that. So the simple example is photon shot noise. So suppose I have a resonator, a microwave or optical. It has some resonance frequency and I send in uh, a laser beam at that frequency and it um, you know, classically it would just produce some coherent state. So this is a phasor diagram of the in-phase and quadrature amplitudes of the electric field and classically I would just have this. But quantum mechanically, the, this is like position and momentum of the harmonic oscillator that I'm, the, of the cavity. You can't know both at the same time, so there's some uncertainty blob, uh, the vacuum noise. And, uh, the vacuum noise has two quadratures, this one and that one, and it interferes with the coherent drive in an interesting way. So this produces some uncertainty in the phase of the uh, phaser in the electric field, and this produces some uncertainty in the length, and that corresponds to photon shot noise. It's the amount of energy in the cavity is fluctuating, even though I have a perfectly stable classical drive applied to it, and it's because of the interference between the classical drive and the quantum uncertainty of the electric field inside. So I can, uh, if I measure, and it's this that leads to the shot noise. And uh, so I can think of a, uh, um, the photon, measuring the photon number as a kind of rectification of this vacuum noise. So what do I mean? So here's a frequency, and this is uh, the cavity, let's say at zero temperature. So it can, the electric field can have a spectral density that is non-zero only at positive frequencies. It, the spontaneous emission into the vacuum is possible, but you can't get any energy out of the vacuum. And it's, that spectral density has some shape, and it's filtered by the cavity, so inside the cavity, it's strongly peaked around the resonance frequency, okay? And now I'm going to turn on a classical drive. I'm going to get a laser, big amplitude. There's no difference, but lasers, everybody thinks of a laser as a quantum mechanical thing, but it's actually the same as a classical radio station. Uh, and the only thing that's quantum mechanical is what determines its frequency. So I put a coherent drive, it's like cosine, electric field is like cosine omega t, so it's got a positive frequency part and a negative frequency part. The cosine is two parts. And um, what happens now if I think about the photon number? Well, that's, that's quadratic in the electric field. So I'm going to get a kind of, uh, I can get interference between this, classical drive at negative frequency and this vacuum noise at positive frequency and the product is going to be at very low frequencies. The interference is going to be down here at low frequencies around zero with a width given by the cavity line width. And, uh, and that is the spectral density of the shot noise. And so if you look at the autocorrelation function for the number of photons that are inside the cavity, there's some average part, and then there's a fluctuation part which whose amplitude is, you know, just given by Poisson statistics. And there's an autocorrelation time which is related to the uh, decay rate of the cavity, kappa. But notice that it's divided by two. That's sort of, if you put one photon in the cavity and wait to see what happens, it, it stays in, it decays out with uh, 
it's still in the cavity at time t with probability e to the minus kappa t, but this is over 2. Why is that? That's the interference effect. It's the in, uh, amplitude of the vacuum electric field autocorrelations because it's the amplitude that's interfering with the classical drive. Okay, so there's a tricky factor of 2 there. Yes, sir? That's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. So, that's, but, so, this, so it's, it's just the decay of the amplitude. That's right. And so, but, the, but when it's driven, the decay of the power in the cavity has that, is at the amplitude rate because it's primarily there as an interference effect. Uh, the, the fluctuations in the power are entirely an interference effect. Yep. Good. Uh, okay. So, um, so now let's do a little different experiment. Let's take the coherent drive and let's red detune it. Let's put it below the resonator uh, frequency uh, by some distance. So here's my uh, cavity filtered vacuum noise of the electric field. Here's my classical drives. And the interference that leads when I count the photon number, it's going to, because this moved down, the shot noise is going to slide over here and occur primarily at positive frequencies. So now the power density of, the shot of this uh, uh, photon number, which might be dispersively coupled to some atom or qubit in my cavity, the spectral density of the shot noise is now asymmetric. It's mostly at positive frequency and not negative. That's very, very cold. You can assign a temperature to it. It's very cold. It's capable only of uh, taking energy away from your system, not giving any to your system. And secretly, the microscopic way that it does that is a Raman process where your, your pump photon scatters off some fluctuation in the system and moves up to the cavity resonance where there's a high density of states absorbing energy from the system, and when it tries to scatter down, there's no density of states there. So that's how optomechanical cooling works, for example. Okay? So the shot noise is cold, and you can even, in some circumstances, assign a temperature to it. Okay, so if you look at that curve in detail, it's just the Lorentzian of the cavity resonance, uh, but shifted down to near the origin, but not centered on the origin, centered uh, by an amount off the origin equal to the detuning of the uh, laser drive from the resonator. And if I use red detuning, I get a noise at positive frequency, so that's cold. If I use blue detuning, I, the peak will be over here, and it um, has negative temperature, if you want, to causes negative damping. So, of course, this looks just like laser cooling. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. you know, a lot of people think of, of cavity cooling just like laser cooling. Right. So they, they, now, what I'm wondering is, can you think of laser cooling of atoms moving this um, so I find it easier to think about a single cavity mode uh, rather than being in the, like, a, like a Doppler yeah. picture because uh, for some reason you seem to find it easier to think the other way. I can't imagine well, why. Back in the old days, that was... Uh, in the last century, that was the way people That's right. thought of it. You, you should know that early in my career, I was one building away from uh, where, at NIST, where this was going, and I saw the, the Zeman slower, and uh, <laughs> that was fantastic. Um, so, um, yeah, you can, I probably turned this into a Doppler picture. I've never tried. No, but tried, you could do but. the other way. Could you take oh. an atom? Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure you can turn yeah. this into a Doppler. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think you can. You might, you know, because the, um, uh, there's 
now you could you know think of a very long cavity with closely spaced modes. You'd have to deal with the fact that there are many many modes that the um, atom could shift, could Raman scatter the photons into. But so, but I think you could do it. Okay, so <clears throat> again, this asymmetry in the noise is under our control. We we get to choose what the detuning is. And therefore, we can uh, control the rates of uh, this shot noise exciting. If I'm dispersively coupled to some qubit or something, um, exciting um, transitions up and down. OK. So here's an interesting application of this idea, <coughs> which uh, was realized. We, we had the idea a few years ago. I mentioned it to Irfan Siddiqui at the March meeting. Three weeks later, they had the experiment working, including having to build a, fabricate a second sample. So they were pretty fast. Um, so imagine I have a qubit, a two-level system, and I'm Robbie flopping it. I'm driving it on resonance, okay? And I go into some rotating frame where I forget about the, um, the big Zeeman splitting of the qubit, the sigma z. All I have is this coherent Robbie coupling, coupling to sigma x. And if that's all I had, then the, the uh, eigenstates in this rotating frame are, you know, qubit is a superposition of ground that excited with a plus sign or a minus sign. So x and minus x eigenstates of this. Um, but, it, but the qubit also uh, is dispersively coupled to the cavity. So the frequency of the cavity depends on whether the qubit's in uh, down or up. Uh, and that produces this kind of coupling. Uh, and so the uh, shot noise is going to be driving sigma z, and sigma z doesn't commute with sigma x, so it's going to cause, you know, in your head, you could just interchange z and x, and you would, you would have the thing I had before. Uh, the Robbie rate is like uh, maybe very, so the qubit splitting might be 5 gigahertz, and it, and you know, the refrigerator is cold enough that you can actually be in the ground state for that splitting. But when I go into this rotating frame, the Rabi frequency uh, splitting is less than a millikelvin. It's 20, 20 megahertz or less. And, um, and so, you know, the outside world will look like very high temperature here. But I can use, I can control <coughs> the spectral density of this shot noise to cool even this tiny splitting to, towards the ground state and, um, and get an effective temperature in the you know, 100 microkelvin range uh, just by using red detuning of a microwave drive on the resonator detuned by an amount equal to the Rabi frequency, which in turn depends on how hard I'm Rabi flapping it. And, uh, and it works uh, extremely well. In fact, we can get greater polarization in the x direction with a one millikelvin splitting than we could get uh, with um, in the original <coughs> uh, qubit splitting of five gigahertz and using the dilution fridge. So it actually gets uh, colder. And then uh, related ideas were extended by uh, uh, Michel Devere's group uh, to do two qubit, uh, autonomous uh, two qubit entanglement. You turn on six simultaneous microwave drives, you wait, and a bell state just falls out. Uh, so here's the, here's the Berkeley experiment with a single qubit being stabilized in the x direction. So here's a Ramsey experiment. You make a pi over two pulse, you wait. You make a pi over two pulse, you measure. There's the Ramsey fringes. There's a certain uh, decay time, not very uh, impressive. If you turn on this uh, uh, bath engineer, engineered bath, then you can make the Ramsey fringes last forever. Doesn't mean you can store a qubit because you're stabilizing just one state, not, not two. Uh, but it demonstrates that you can reach an effective temperature very, very low. You can also use blue detuning and stabilize the, uh, the other state. OK, so, um, so that, uh, that's a first proof of principle that you can do this kind of bath engineering with a single qubit. Now we'd like to 
dream ahead to the day when we could do many body physics with large arrays of um, qubits. And uh, I couldn't convince the Berkeley group to do a million qubits, but they were willing to try three. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so these guys did that. So there's a, a copper cavity. Uh, so that copper, so that you can put a magnetic field in there, and the magnetic field is used in uh, squid loops and these transmon qubits to uh, kind of give a giant Zeeman effect. You can tune the qubits relative to each other using this magnetic field. And uh, you can send in microwave drives, and you have a parametric amplifier, and you can uh, both con drive this cavity, drive the qubits, and read out the state of the qubits, all using one wire, essentially. OK, so uh, there's the copper uh, piece of the copper cavity. Um, uh, 7 gigahertz resonance frequency, 10 megahertz line width, um, qubits uh, at lower frequencies. And uh, they they're have a vacuum Rabi coupling to the cavity, which they're detuned from. And they also have direct dipole-dipole interactions. The nearest neighbor ones, you can, it's not really dipole, right? They're <laughs> their spacing is comparable to their size. But anyway, dipole-like coupling, 180 megahertz. And then uh, uh, because it falls off roughly like 1 over r cubed, this is an order of magnitude smaller. So it's a little many-body system, three-body system. Uh, and um, putting the ground state at zero energy, we can uh, make a simple Hamiltonian, which uh, uh, accurately fits the first nine energy levels and how they move around as a function of the uh, magnetic field, which is uh, moving the outer two guys relative to the center guy's transition frequency. There's also a trim coil that can uh, differentially move those two. Um, and uh, so in this uh, spaghetti of levels, there's the ground state with no excitations. There's a, the E manifold that has one qubit excited, or one, I'm going to think of this as a boson Hubbard model. So there's one boson in the system, one quantum. Um, and it can, you know, roughly speaking, there are three states. It could be here, here, here. But the actual eigenstates, of course, are superpositions of that. And then there are uh, uh, the F manifold, where there are two excitations uh, spread out among the three sites. And then, of course, there are higher ones. But the simple Hamiltonian I gave you is good enough to, to produce a good fit to the spectrum. So, yeah, so this, the, sorry, the <coughs> colored lines are fits to the experimental, sorry, are the experimental spectra. And the dashed lines are the predictions from the model as you vary the. Um, uh, magnetic field, which moves the individual qubit frequencies around. So the model includes the precise numerical estimates of the J1, 2, and the uh, It's a fit of J1 and uh, of, it's a fit. These are oh, fit parameters. Nice yeah, yeah, right. We also do uh, quasi-first principles simulations with um, adaptive grid and Maxwell equation solvers and then have a trick for quantizing those classical electrical engineering results. And uh, we didn't bring all of that apparatus to bear here, but in experiments at Yale, we can get these parameters to 1%-ish. So that would be my next question. So do microscopic calculations in general give numbers? Not yeah, really yeah, much? yeah. So, um, it works surprisingly well. Well, uh, we asked them, to, we wanted them to do a very long array. You could have. Uh, it's closer to the thermodynamic limit. It's, <laughs> it's, it's practically there. It's a large expansion when Yeah, roughly. Yeah. 
<laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. All right. We'd like to get to where you're at. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so, uh, so, uh, uh, well, so our, our local heroes have been thinking about a different kind of a bath, which is a kind of grand canonical ensemble where you can exchange energy, entropy, and particles with the bath. What we're trying to do here is realize a canonical ensemble where you exchange entropy and energy, but not particles. We want the particle number to be conserved. And by particle, I mean the number of excitations in our, in our lattice. And I'm going to think of those as, um, as bosons I have. So it, it turns out that the, um, the so-called transmon qubits, which I'm not going to explain, but they're basically little antennas coupled together by Josen junctions, they are, roughly speaking, harmonic oscillators with a small anharmonicity, which is negative. Uh, the energy level spacing of the, the Josen junction gives you a cosine potential instead of a quadratic potential. So there's a slightly negative anharmonicity. So I can think of this as a Bose-Hubbard model with negative u, and then I have this dipole coupling among the different um, bosons. So that's my quantum simulation I'm trying to do. With uh, uh, Typically, people have a positive view they're interested in, in condensed matter physics, but uh, this is an uh, uh, easiest thing to realize here is negative. And, and that first term is the one you uh, yeah, this is the one I can control with the magnetic field. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then this is fixed by the charging energy, essentially. Okay, so then I want to put those guys in a cavity and couple them to photons of the cavity through some dipole coupling, a uh, uh, vacuum Rabi coupling. And um, now notice that because uh, of coupling to the cavity, a qubit could decay and emit a photon to the cavity, so that the the, the B dagger B, this the, the B dagger Bs are not conserved. Uh, but let's um, let's set aside this part, the anharmonicity, for a moment, and let's try to solve this. I notice it's completely quadratic, so even I can solve it. And uh, so there's some. Uh, the cavity mode picks up a little bit of um, uh, qubit uh, harmonic mode and vice versa. And so you, you can diagonalize this thing with such a transformation, and you end up with a dressed cavity oscillator been, whose frequency has been shifted a little bit, and dressed qubit modes where um, the frequency is shifted and the the dipole coupling has spread out, you know, made the normal modes of the, of the array be mostly qubit, but a little bit of photon. So now I will put back the, um, the quadratic, the negative u uh, term, the, the quartic term, and it will generate a quartic term for the dressed qubits, some dispersive coupling of the dressed qubits to the dressed cavity and some self-curve of the dressed cavity. And uh, within this approximation, these, the, this uh, number of dressed excitations in the array uh, is uh, conserved. There's a, there's a uh, you know, it's within certain rotating wave approximations and so forth but uh, I have a conserved boson number in my Bose-Hubbard model. Yep. Uh, who is rotating wave approximation? Uh, yeah. Atomic physics is pretty exact because they're always. Yeah, so the frequency spreads here and the high Q of the cavity, and so it depends on parameters, but it's quite good. So the, so the, the, the qubit in free space, a transmon qubit would have a, spontaneous emission time of 300 nanoseconds. And in a cavity far detuned from there, it's highly protected. It can be um, uh, 300 uh, microseconds. So it's, it can be much longer, yeah. 
So factors of, it's protected by factors of 100. Now, so it's true that when you're making a quantum simulator, you know, if the, the bosons will only live for a finite length of time, but if it's long enough that it can hop many times back and forth and quasi-equilibrate, maybe that's good enough. Okay, so now I'm just going to use the trick I taught you earlier with a red detuned drive. And uh, so the pump is going in there. It's, it's detuned from the cavity. It's very far detuned from the qubit, so it's not exciting the qubits. But maybe there are excitations in my qubit array which are moving around. And as they move around, the polarizability of that array or the cavity pull, the dispersive shift, is fluctuating. And what that does is Raman pump photons from your drive up to the cavity frequency, taking energy away and cooling the system. Okay, so again, it's, it's the dispersive coupling and the fluctuations in the shot noise coupled to this operator in the uh, bath. It can cause transitions which cool the bosons to low energy states but this commutes with the total boson number. So I'm going to have a nice uh, canonical ensemble. Yep. Yep. So that's, a, that's a something we're looking at. You could imagine um, uh, if you have attractive U, the, a low energy state for, let's say, if you have a big array and I have 100 excitations, they might all want to be on almost the same site or, or in a, some kind of soliton. That's true. Um, uh, but um, the dissipation is sufficiently low. You would have to turn on a bath to cool it to that soliton state. And we're actually looking at that, the rate that we could get for that to happen. Right. On site, there'll be uh, negative Yeah, so, the, so um, if it literally, so I made an approximation that the uh, Hamiltonian had only this quartic piece and not, there's a sixth order or an eighth order. And, um, so if, they re if thousands of excitations all pile into one site, my Hamiltonian would actually break down. But um, you can think, uh, in a certain parameter regime that I'm actually talking about looking at the dynamics of some states which are not actually the ground state which would have many bosons in one place. Yeah, so, 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 so then if you, if you suppose there are all these issues and then uh, why don't you try then the positive view? What, what, what difficulty well, is this for this particular simple qubit, um, the anharmonicity is always negative and so the dressed states always inherit a negative anharmonicity. Uh, there are other uh, fancier things of qubit types which uh, Vlad uh, has experience with where you can have large positive views. Um, but it, the, it's, yeah, that, so somebody should do that experiment. Where's Vlad? <laughs> oh, there he is. Okay, just a hint. Um, so, so, the, uh, so again, you can do Fermi's golden rule, and the cooling rate is the spectral density of the shot noise, same, same uh, physics here. And then there's some complicated many-body matrix element that has to do with how much, as the excitations zip back and forth, they modulate the dispersive shift of the cavity. That's that thing there. Uh, okay, so, uh, so first part of the experiment is you figure out some way to excite the system into these different states. And then without doing any bath engineering, just look at the spontaneous decay uh, of the system. Because even uh, there's always, uh, sadly in our world, there's always dissipation. Uh, so if you remember, F is the two excitation manifold. And if you put the system into the fifth F state, this is a, as a function of time, you measure whether it's still there, it falls down, and you see that uh, E2, the second single uh, excitation subspace probability, rises up. So most of the decay from F5 is to E2. 
And if you think about the shapes of the wave functions and what's allowed by the Purcell decay of these excitations out of the cavity, uh, it, it, it all uh, makes some sense. And you can do, do similar things starting from other states. And the, you don't need to worry about any of the details, just that you see the sort of time scales for different transitions depending on selection rules vary from one microsecond to 30 microseconds. Okay, so now we want to turn on the bath, and uh, for example, um, here's the ground state, here's the same one boson uh, manifold, the two boson manifold, and we might want to do cooling from E2 to E1, perhaps. So again, if you really cool the system to the ground state, it would, it would go here, there'd be no bosons left. But in, within a canonical ensemble simulation, I want to cool within this manifold to there or within this manifold to there. So I'm conserving the number of bosons. And uh, so by, by turning on these uh, coherent drives and allowing these uh, Raman processes, I can get um, E2 to decay on fairly short time scales, uh, one or two microseconds, and E1 to come up and have uh, uh, a significant population. You can also do kind of dark state trapping where there's some, you can't, there's some state that's dark, you can't pump the system into there from the ground state, but you can pump up to a higher level and then cool into this dark state and trap population there. Uh, so, uh, and the cooling rates that you get are linear in the pump power. There's a little tricky uh, Stark shift that happens. You need to keep changing, remember, if you want to cool a certain transition, you need the detuning of your drive to, to match that because uh, that's going to give the most likely Raman transition should resonate with that. And uh, these things shift around uh, due to Stark shifts, but if you take that into account, the peak cooling rate is linear in the drive power. It took a, I mean, if you just stick to one frequency, the cur it's not a straight line, but if you think about what's going on, you can get it to work. Okay, so, uh, so as I said, this is very early days, but I'll just show you an example of the kind of control that we can now get in this small many-body system. So here's an axis of some, some readout voltage that tells us um, different states that the system is in, okay? Again, this is some dispersive readout. You don't need to know the details. And this is the population on this axis. So I start at the beginning. Everything is sitting in the ground state, or almost everything, okay? A little bump there. And, um, and now I'm going to turn on a uh, drive which uh, tries to saturate the transition between G and E3. So it's a, a single boson excited state, and the drive is a, adds a single boson. And uh, I approximately saturate it and get approximately equal populations, roughly, in the ground state and in E3. Then I turn on this uh, cooling uh, drive, which will cause the Raman processes that will cool me from E3 to E1, and then pff, the population here disappears, the population there disappears, and it's almost entirely in E1, okay? Uh, then, once I've got it in E1, I can turn on a drive up here, which will take me from E1 to F4, and that gives me a roughly saturated E1 and E4. There's a little bit over here in E2. Then I turn on another cooling drive, which will cool me from F4 to F1, and almost all the population ends up in F1. So, and all these drives are on at the same time. So it's just to illustrate that you can stabilize, you can select some many-body many body eigenstate from this small system. And, uh, and stabilize it through a series of pumps and, and cooling beams. And uh, you stay within uh, the manifold of a given particle number when you do that. And we can get to the ground state of the one boson uh, manifold and the ground state of the uh, two boson manifold, for example. So it's not quite the thermodynamic <laughs> limit, but uh, it's a start. 
and um, I'm running out of time, so I'll just uh, 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 s summarize there that you know we hope this is the beginning of uh, getting towards a more serious uh, n-body large system. Think about pseudo equilibrium thermodynamics of these things, um, perhaps quantum simulations. And, uh, but one thing we will need for, to study many body localization or interesting many body dynamics is we will need to be able to measure local qubit operators and correlate them in different parts of the system. In this small system where the many body states are kind of discrete, we're able to just read out which many body state you're in and, and, um, and know what's going on. But for a, to, to build a useful quantum simulator, we will have to figure out how to fill uh, that gap as well. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. How many do you think? Uh, 10, 20, 30, uh, 40, I, I'd be surprised if you could get past 10, okay. but I. There's just too many possibilities. Okay. Yeah, now this is for the, this is uh, an experiment that was done in a 3D cavity with the transmons arrayed on some sapphire or substrate in there. They also have experiments going with, uh, you know, the 2D array, and you can bring up separate readout lines mm -hmm. that will cover, will pick up the state of just one qubit or a small number. And then, you know, you can imagine uh, being able to measure correlators, two-point correlators or something in, in much bigger arrays. But um, so those experiments are, are yeah, th those, for, the, for the 3D cavity where all you have is one wire coming in and it's doing all these things, it's driving the qubits, measuring the qubits, pumping the cavity, you know. There's a limit on how much information from frequency multiplexing you can get out of there. But if you have a 2D thing and you can bring in spatial probes and do spatial multiplexing, then you can get more bits of information. So what I understand is that uh, with this dispersive coupling, you want to use non-elastic non scattering. Which yep. Is right. But uh, if I want to not fine-tune my laser tool, is it possible to use Ah, ah, so the, yeah, so I think your question has to do with, um, whoop, there it is. So the, the range of energies that I can remove from the system by this Raman process is deter determined, well, the center frequency is determined by the detuning, but the range is determined by the Q of the cavity. And uh, if I have a many-body system, I'm, I'm going to have many transitions that I have to cool, and they might have different frequencies. I think that's your question. So one thing you can do is make this broader. The downside of that is then um, various Purcell decay rates and things get worse for the qubits. Another thing you could do is... The, the temperature is not worth the um, So if you're temperature, yeah. Yeah, uh, although if I'm just trying to cool to the ground state, I don't have to worry that it's not really equilibrium bath as long as it gets me there. Um, but the, there, there's another problem that the rate, the, because the qubits are slightly hybridized with the cavity, the worse the cavity, the faster the Purcell decay rate in the qubit. So that's not so good. But another thing you, we pointed out, and uh, hasn't been done in the experiment, but in principle could be done, is you could sweep the cavity, the detuning of the pump from the cavity back and forth, keeping it red detuned, and eventually get, get yourself to the right place. So that, um, that's another uh, interesting question. You could also do what you were saying is keep the pump the same, but have multi-modes in the cavity that would have different uh, effective detunings. That could also work. Increasing 
particle number. Um, uh, okay, let's see. Um, I guess it. I guess it actually goes up because there's an n in the in the matrix elements, uh, but the probably I would want each individual qubit less strongly. Each individual qubit will be less strongly coupled to the cavity because the mode volume is getting bigger. So probably it's a constant. I, I have to think about it, but it. It depends on whether you're squeezing more qubits into a fixed volume cavity or you're scaling the size of the cavity and the number of qubits. So it's either fixed or, um, or getting better. That one? <laughs> so, so I, like, I feel like a lot of these questions about uh, the thermodynamic limit are already sort of answered. Yeah. That yeah. So, so this is an experiment. Jake's referring to an experiment with a, a cavity that's filled with a dye. And the dye is very efficient that if it absorbs a photon, um, it um, Re-emits one almost always, and and but with a lower energy typically, and you can th uh, e thermally equilibrate a gas of photons with the temperature of the dye, and to some approximation, not induce any interactions among the photons due to the presence of the dye, uh, and you can make a uh, a Bose-Einstein condensate of photons by that means, which is not the same thing as a superfluid. But, uh, and so, um, so uh, I'm actually interested in thinking about microwave versions of that same thing. And you could have there's different ways of setting up the dissipators so that they couple here or to the hopping, and you could make, nice thing is you could send in a coherent drive and then try to turn it into a thermal gas of photons, and you can go over here and measure the coherent part that comes out and the incoherent quasi-equilibrated part. I haven't got any um, experimentals to do that yet, but uh, I'm, yeah, so I'm thinking along the similar lines. Yeah. 